Well, welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams. I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work at the University of Kentucky in the Forestry Extension. And um, Billy, you know, every week we say we have a slam-packed show and, you know, we're not disappointing on that. No, you're exactly right, Renee. And it's glad to be, or I'm glad to be here with you today on this beautiful day here in Lexington oh, across the state gorgeous. of Kentucky. Absolutely gorgeous. But thank you all for being with us today. Yeah, we've got three great segments that we're going to be covering today. We have Dr. Jacob Muller is going to be continuing the Forestry 101 series. And we're also going to be talking about some of the recent ice storm damage and some of the resources that are available to help you with that. And then we have the ever popular tree of the week. And I'll, I'll exactly. save that to, and let Laurie introduce that in a little bit. But again, glad to have you all with us. If you want to interact with us, use the chat pod if you're on Zoom. And if you're joining us via Facebook Live, please use the comment section. Um, all of these are recorded and you can watch them later as well. Exactly. So anyone can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and they'll all be there. So I know sometimes, you know, I'm like, oh, what they say. And so that's an easy way to, to figure out what that is. But right. I guess as they would say, let's get on with the show. Yes, indeed. So uh, I think we're going to start off with Dr. Jacob Muller. Jacob, good morning, Jacob. How are you? Morning. How are you doing? Doing well. Tell us a little bit about this. I think this is part seven of your Forestry 101. This is part seven. Yes, the long-awaited part <laughs> seven. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's the seventh and final um, of, the, of the series. And, and so we've been building up talking about um, why we manage, how we manage, uh, how we develop a management plan. And today is really just kind of sending us off thinking about the future, why we manage for the, the future and some considerations uh, that we might uh, make in our management planning uh, to accommodate uh, any uncertainty that, that might lie ahead. And so that's, that's kind of the focus of this part seven. Uh, welcome back to Forestry 101. Uh, and today is going to be our last part uh, of the Forestry 101 series. And so we've talked about a number of topics over the past few months. Uh, we've talked about talking to a forester. We've talked about the ecology uh, of forests. Uh, we've talked about developing a management plan. And so a lot of these planning things. And to continue that idea of, of planning is to, to plan for the future. And so this last part of Forestry 101 one, we're going to be talking about uh, adaptive management uh, and managing for the uncertainty uh, that are of the future conditions in which we'll be managing. And so we've talked about managing for a number of uh, resources from water resources uh, to uh, recreational opportunities to forest health uh, to timber resources uh, but we also uh, manage uh, for for diversity right and so what is forest diversity uh, and why is it important uh, as we think about managing our own woodlands and thinking about managing into the future uh, and so there's a couple different uh, parts uh, of, of diversity. And so we can think about species diversity, uh, which is also known as species composition. So we can manage for uh, a composition or a suite of species, a diversity uh, or a diverse uh, suite of uh, tree species. Uh, and we can also manage for structural diversity. And so different structures in the forest, uh, we have some big trees, some smaller trees, and so we can manage for having a diversity uh, of, uh, of structures in our woodland. And when we do that, when we increase the diversity of species, when we increase the structural diversity, we actually build in resiliency to the forest. So if we have a particular disturbance that comes in, say an, inv an invasive plant, uh, or, or even uh, an insect or disease that targets particular species or t particular sizes of trees, if we only have one uh, species or one size of tree, that particular uh, uh, perturbation um, uh, targets, then we might uh, be left with without a forest if, if that particular species and tree, uh, tree size uh, is wiped out, right? And so if we have a diverse range of species uh, and structures, we can really increase the likelihood that uh, the, the forest will uh, be able to accommodate certain levels of, of perturbation. 
So when we're managing our forests, it's always important to ask, uh, ask yourself, what are some things that affect the long-term health and sustainability uh, of the forest? Uh, and our management plans have a direct implication uh, on the overall forest health and sustainability. Right? Good management choices uh, can promote uh, longevity of the forest and long-term health and sustainability, while poor management decisions can have a very adverse effect on the long-term uh, sustainability uh, of our forests uh, or woodland. Uh, obviously, land use changes have significant impacts in the forest. Uh, changing ecological conditions uh, are something that we're beginning to think more and more about as we manage our forests. And so uh, we can think about changes to uh, disturbances, how disturbances change over time if we're having increased uh, risk of wildfire that could um, uh, kill uh, parts or all of our, our forest. So as, as foresters, uh, we need to be asking ourselves, what can we do to address uh, these challenges uh, and manage for the uncertainty associated uh, with changing future conditions uh, to ensure uh, that we have sustainable, productive forest uh, long into the future? Uh, and I propose that we think about adaptive management. Right? And so ad adaptive management is uh, this dynamic approach to managing. Uh, so we monitor and assess uh, the effectiveness uh, of our treatments, uh, and then we modify our efforts to ensure that we're meeting our management uh, objectives uh, over time. So traditional management plans uh, are kind of a linear process, right? And so we define our goals and our objectives and our time frames. We evaluate the resources and inventory, uh, our forest. Uh, we formulate an activity schedule uh, and strategize uh, to meet our goals. Uh, and then we implement those goals, right? Uh, when we talk about an adaptive management, uh, uh, strategy. Uh, it's really much more uh, of a circular uh, management approach uh, where we define our management goals and objectives uh, just as we do in a traditional management um, uh, strategy, but now we assess the potential future impacts and vulnerabilities. Uh, we can look at different woodland vulnerability assessments, uh, and then we evaluate our management objectives given the impacts uh, of of future changing conditions. And then we uh, identify and implement uh, different uh, adaptive management approaches and tactics to help us meet our management objectives. And then we implement uh, our, uh, our management uh, activities and we monitor. Right? We monitor and evaluate the effectiveness uh, of our implemented actions. So forest managers uh, and woodland owners can utilize different adaptation strategies to accommodate a certain level of change and facilitate an adaptive response in the forest. So by promoting adaptation towards a desired condition that is defined in the context of a changing environment, we can increase ecosystem resilience and reduce the effort needed to maintain that condition over time. So to accommodate uncertainty, uh, we might approach forestry uh, and woodland management uh, by considering the potential for changing conditions to influence forest dynamics uh, and how we can help ecosystems adapt to those conditions. So what are some management strategies uh, and how can we apply them to uh, our own uh, forest, forestry and woodland management? Uh, and so we can think about, again, managing for the future. Uh, we want to increase resiliency, and we can do that by uh, promoting species with a wide uh, ecological, ecological uh, amplitude uh, or range of tolerances. So those species that have a wide range of tolerance to shade, to moisture, uh, to temp temperature, those species are going to do better given uh, a range of conditions that the future might uh, bring. And we can also focus on species that are uh, more tolerant to disturbances, both current disturbances and uh, future disturbances, if that's increasing wildfire or flooding, species that have a built-in adaptation to the disturbances are going to do better uh, in the future. Uh, species that are better adapted uh, to future like likely conditions, so 
uh, species that like more moisture, can tolerate more moisture, uh, as well as warmer uh, temperatures. Uh, and also woodlands and ecosystems uh, that are diverse and heterogeneous, right? So a lot of uh, species diversity and structural diversity are going to be much more resilient to uh, a range of future conditions. Uh, additionally, uh, we can focus on woodland uh, management approaches that promote resiliency and health uh, to reduce the hazards uh, of, of future disturbances, uh, such as invasives and uh, reducing the risk and replacing uh, fire events. Uh, we can define our management objectives in the context of a dynamic system, right? Are the species that are here today going to be here uh, in 50 years? Uh, these are important questions. Uh, and lastly, we can utilize silvicultural tactics to help promote forest function, forest health, and forest sustainability. And so focusing on those species traits, uh, structures, uh, different structures in the canopy that might create microsite conditions for particular species to grow uh, are going to help increase uh, the overall resiliency of our forest and make conditions more favorable for a range of species to grow. So I'm going to end the Forestry 101 series talking about 10 things uh, that you can do to help promote long-term sustainability and forest health in your own woodland. Uh, so the first is to protect water and soils. Uh, it's so key that we protect, protect the resources that plants and uh, trees need to grow. Uh, the second is to improve the capability and capacity for your trees to tolerate and resist uh, uh, invasive uh, insects and diseases. Uh, third is to prevent and control invasive plants uh, that threaten the native uh, flora and fauna in uh, your forest ecosystem. Uh, the fourth is to control damage to young trees of desirable species. So protecting those trees uh, when they're young so that they can grow up uh, into uh, major components uh, of the forest overstory. Uh, five is to protect rare and sensitive plant and animal communities. Uh, six promote a wide range of species, uh, tree species. Again, uh, having a wide uh, diversity of tree species. So having a large species composition uh, is gonna increase uh, your resiliency. Uh, and having a wide range of sizes and structures in your forest uh, is also going to promote resiliency in the forest. Uh, it's, it's kind of this uh, holistic approach to thinking about management uh, and managing for a wide range uh, of, of species uh, and sizes uh, in your forest. Uh, number eight is to consider how trees that you plant or promote today uh, will grow in the future, right? And so we're only here for little snapshots of, of the entire life of the forest. And so the more we can do uh, when we're in uh, the forest to help ensure that that tree is going to uh, do well into the future uh, is important uh, in that includes thinking about the growing conditions for that tree into the future, right? Next is to monitor your woodlands uh, and the effects of your management tactics. And lastly, uh, is to modify your management plans uh, if your monitoring ef uh, efforts unveil uh, any problems, right? So this all goes back to that adaptive management uh, diagram uh, where we're talking about assessing the vulnerabilities, modifying our management objectives given any uh, 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 vulnerabilities that we unveil, uh, and then implementing adaptation strategies uh, in the forest uh, and monitor monitoring those to ensure that we're meeting our objectives. So ultimately, we can help ensure the long-term sustainability of our forests through active, adaptive forest management strategies and practices. Uh, and staying engaged, uh, just like we're doing today and learning about relevant, important forest management topics uh, and always planning for the future. Uh, 
and that uh, goes hand in hand with sustainable forest management. Uh, in fact, sustainable forest management is exactly what is needed uh, to help us promote and enhance the forest health, the forest function, and the forest productivity uh, long into the future. Uh, so thank you for joining me for Forestry 101, uh, and I hope you'll join me uh, on our next adventure, uh, so stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, until then, I hope you're well, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Well, thank you, Jacob. We greatly appreciate that video, and um, I know you've done this whole series, and we do have um, all of those posted on YouTube as a series, so if anybody wants to go to our YouTube page, they could watch that, watch all of those, but, um, you know, so managing your woodlands is a big deal, right? You can't just leave it alone anymore, and so, you know, what would you tell somebody that, um, say, anyone from they just bought their land, and, you know, they need to manage it, to someone who's not touched it? And they need to manage it. I mean, are there different strategies that they would need to do depending on what they're looking at? Yeah. I think Focus areas, it, I guess. <laughs> sure. It, it really all comes down to, uh, to your management objectives and, and what you want to do with your land. And I think a lot of times the best way to figure that out is to go spend time uh, in your woodland and get a feel for uh, the different opportunities or what, what opportunities might be uh, realistic to you uh, in the in the future, and you can uh, speak with your county extension agent or someone uh, here uh, in uh, forestry extension uh, to help you think about those management objectives, and then you work with a forester to really lay out those planning um, management plans and uh, articulate your objectives and, and really reach those uh, those management goals long down the, the line. And so this. This topic today was in line with all that, but it, it kind of builds in this extra layer of thinking about the uncertainty associated with the future and uh, some little um, uh, things to consider when when you're planning for that uncertainty. So, you know, we're we're fortunate here in Kentucky to have a lot of support for landowners that are interested in managing it. So don't feel like you're alone. If you've not done anything with your woods and you've been thinking about it, it's not too late to get started. And, um, you know, as Jacob has mentioned, there's a lot of people that are around to help you organizations and foresters out there that can meet with you and help you achieve your objectives for your property. All right. Well, I don't see any questions. So thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, and Jacob, we'll see you again in a few minutes. Um, but right, think, exactly. Yeah, but we are going to switch gears real quick, and we're going to bring in our ever popular um, Tree of the Week series. And um, we have Laurie Thomas joining us. Uh, good morning, Laurie. Good morning. How are you all? So, so what's, uh, what's in store for this week? <laughs> So this week I've, I've, we've delved into the ashes. I haven't done any other ash trees yet. And I actually picked my favorite. I love this. It's the blue ash. It's a unique Hi. ash. It looks a little different. So um, here we go. Let's do blue ash. Great. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the blue ash. Blue ash, Fraxinus quadrangulata, is a member of the Oleaceae or olive family, which is a large family found in the temperate and tropical forests of the northern hemisphere. There are approximately 16 species in the Fraxinus or ash genus native to the United States, and only five may attain commercial size and abundance. Blue ash is a medium-sized tree that typically grows up to about 70 feet tall and about 18 to 40 inches in diameter. It is a moderately to slow growing tree and can live up to 300 years, but typically lives 150 to 200 years. Blue ash has a relatively small range and is found primarily in parts of Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky with small pockets in surrounding states. It's typically found on limestone derived soils and in Kentucky, it's often seen in the inner bluegrass along with burr oak in old pastures and farm fields, as well as along the Kentucky River Palisades. It grows best in full sun in moist, well-drained soils. The leaves of blue ash are oppositely arranged on the stem. It is one of the four groups of trees in Kentucky that has oppositely arranged leaves, the maples, ashes, dogwoods, and buckeyes. So remember the mnemonic, mad buck, 
so you can remember the trees with oppositely arranged leaves in Kentucky. The deciduous leaves are pinnately compound, which means leaflets are arranged on either side of the central stem, and they're between 7 to, inch, 7 to 11 inches long and are made up of usually 7 to 11 leaflets. The leaflets are egg-shaped to lance-shaped and have coarsely serrated margins. They are dark green on the surface and the underside is pale. Autumn color is yellowish and the leaves tend to drop early. A great identification characteristic for blue ash is the twig. It typically has four corky ridges which gives it a square appearance. Blue ash flowers are monaceous and tend to be green to purple and in clusters. They generally appear before the leaves or just as the leaves are emerging in the spring and they are wind pollinated. The fruit is a single Samara, which is a winged seed, and these hang in one to one and a half inch long drooping clusters. The seeds ripen late in summer into autumn, and they are wind dispersed, and trees begin seed production around 25 years of age, with good seed crops every three to four years. The bark is ashy gray to brown and rough and somewhat scaly on younger trees. Trees develop irregular fissures and scaly, almost shaggy ridges as it ages. Blue ash bark is unlike green ash and white ash bark, which tends to produce interwoven distinct ridges and furrows. The heartwood is a light medium brown color, and the sapwood can be very wide and tends to be beige or light brown, but there isn't always a clear demarcation between sapwood and heartwood. Overall, blue ash wood tends to be darker in color and less strong or dense than white ash wood. It is rated to perishable to slightly durable in regards to, to decay. The wood is used for flooring, millwork, boxes, crates, and tool handles. Blue ash, like other ash species, has some wildlife and faunal value. The leaves are the host plant for the tiger swallowtail butterfly. The seeds are eaten by wood duck, cardinal, evening grosbeak, purple finch, red-winged blackbird, and wild turkey, as well as fox squirrel and white-footed mice. One of the insect pests of blue ash is emerald ash borer, EAB. This invasive insect pest has caused great mortality to North American ash trees. It is from Asia and was first discovered in North America and Michigan in 2002. By 2009, it was detected in Kentucky and since then has continued to spread across the state. Blue ash is impacted by EAB and decline has been documented, but as of right now, it appears to be less impacted than our other ash species. As of 2021, the Kentucky Champion Blue Ash is also the national champion. It is located in Jefferson County. The tree is 217 inches in circumference, 76 feet tall, with an 88-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about blue ash. The common name of blue ash was derived from a bluish blackish dye that pioneers extracted from the inner bark and used in dyeing yarn and other textiles. The city of blue ash, Ohio, now an inner suburb of Cincinnati, drew its name from the blue ash trees in the area, which were used to build the community's earliest buildings. According to legend, Kentucky statesman Henry Clay named his Lexington estate Ashland in honor of the blue ash tree. The scientific genus name Fraxinus is Latin for the common name of the ash tree, and the species name Quadrangulata means four-angled, referring to the square twigs. I'm glad you joined me to learn about this native ash and get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the beautiful bluegrass blue ash. Well, thank you, Lori. We greatly appreciate that you are uh, doing that video each week. We really like it. Um, you know, I've noticed that uh, our blue ash, what you see in most horse, horse farms, you see this huge tree and it seems, seems to be in the middle of a field. Is that what maybe some it's, of them are? It's definitely one of them. So, and especially when you think about Lexington, Woodford, Bourbon County, you mm -hmm. know, you drive, do your country drive out there. Um, you'll see those big trees in the middle of the field and it's probably, it could be a burr oak if it has a more rounded, kept 
type of crown, um, or it could be the blue ash. They tend to have in those fields, they'll have this look of um, kind of like it shoots up this way and maybe it's lost part of the top due to whatever right. reason. And those are usually those big trees that we see out on those horse farms. So, and I think that's probably why one of the reasons I like it, it seems kind of unique. It's got a little more, its growth form isn't quite as nice as white ash. It's got those square twigs different bark and, and it's very typical of what we see out in the bluegrass area. So um, yeah, it's one of my favorites. We do have a comment that said um, blue ash seems to be more resistant to emerald ash borer. Yeah. You heard about well, that? And I would let Dr. Crocker speak like to is Ellen still on here <laughs> as well, but um, and it does it as she as we talked about this, it is impacted, um, and um, but it doesn't seem to have as much of it. It's not as impacted as much as our other ashes as of yet. So, but I'll let you speak more to that. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and and uh, the white and the green ash are the two species that in our area are just being you know killed um, by that emerald ash borer. There's still a lot of blue ash left. And um, there's a couple different reasons for that. It's less attractive to those female beetles as they're looking for trees and laying their eggs. Um, mm -hmm. But also it seems to have kind of better ability to defend themselves from those larvae if they are in the tree. And um, some researchers with the Forest Service um, uh, in Delaware, Ohio, Jennifer Cook and her lab have actually been looking at, you know, what's going on there, as well as there are, you know, occasionally, very rarely, some white and green ash that are are able to defend themselves. So trying to look at the mechanisms of that. And they found that there's actually this really wide range. It's not kind of one thing that's happening, um, but they have like lots of different ways that some of these trees are able to defend themselves better, be it, you know, stopping the insect, um, killing that insect through some chemical method or, you know, walling it off and kind of sealing off that damage that way. So it is exciting. Um, and, you know, time will tell what will happen with blue ash. I think uh, there certainly hasn't been the same kind of death um, as there has been with white and green ash. Um, but you do see damage on those trees, which can add up over time. Okay. Well, thank you for that addition, Ellen. We yeah, really no doubt. It. That's good. And it's good to hear there may be some hope for <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Laurie, thank you for those series. Yeah, they're really good. You do a great job with them. We really appreciate okay. it. All right. Take care. Bye. So moving on, you know, you can't tell by looking at the window just today, a couple right? weeks ago, we were, you know, dealing with ice storms and now we're dealing with flooding and, you know, and there's always seems like some time a type of threat coming to our woods. So um, right. Jacob, you and some others have been working on some um, resources to help out here a little bit. We have. Yep. Uh, and so we put together some information, uh, as many probably recall, this isn't the first ice storm, nor will it be the last. Uh, and um, it wasn't quite as severe as some of the past ones uh, about, I guess, 2009, I think was a rather big one. Um, this one wasn't quite as severe, but some areas did get hit uh, pretty hard. And we've been getting reports from landowners that have uh, seen some pretty significant damage. And uh, we just want to let you know that we do have resources. Uh, there are um, folks out there to help you uh, assess the damage and help you take some management uh, actions to not just uh, salvage uh, what might be lost, but also look for, for hazards in your uh, woodland. And so uh, put together a little presentation that uh, we can share here that walks through uh, a number of those things and, and some considerations that you as a landowner uh, could be thinking about um, if you've had any ice damage in your own woodland. One thing I'll point out um, that there is a, a wildfire danger right now and you wouldn't think about, it's kind of hard to think about these two things being so close in time, but we had the ice damage. And then we've got a lot of fuels on the ground now from branches getting knocked down, some ladder fuels. And, uh, and when you're out there running a chainsaw with these dry conditions, now there's an increased uh, risk of starting a wildfire. So I talked about that a little bit, but um, something to think about. Right. Uh, so 
we are going to talk about woodland ice damage and uh, some resources to help you uh, take action uh, in your own woodland. And uh, as you uh, are probably well aware, we had a pretty significant ice storm a couple of weeks ago uh, that has caused um, uh, some, some severe damage across the state. Uh, it's not evenly distributed. Some regions uh, were hit harder than others, uh, but nevertheless, uh, some areas uh, saw some significant uh, damage. And uh, so we thought we would put uh, some, some resources together on uh, this little presentation to help you uh, kind of get started uh, managing uh, for, for this ice damage in your own woodland. So what exactly does uh, woodland uh, ice damage look like? Well, it can look like uh, a lot of things actually, uh, and it could look uh, like a lot of these things all at once. And so it's not gonna be evenly distributed across uh, our woodland. Uh, it might range from some low severity uh, damage. So a few uh, branches here and there, or a, a bent uh, tree. Uh, and it, or it could range to uh, uh, actual mortality of the tree, uh, whether it's a stem break uh, or an uprooting uh, of the tree causing uh, the tree to, to fall over in the woods. And so depending on uh, which uh, severity or how severe uh, the damage is, that will really dictate uh, our management for um, for our woodlands and, and, and if whether we decide to try to salvage some of the timber that would otherwise be lost or we focus on uh, improving the health uh, of the damaged tree uh, to help it recover from, from this damage. And so you can see a few photos here, uh, some uh, range uh, of, of severity with the uh, disturbance. You can see up in that upper left hand corner where we actually have a tree that has fallen over, a rather large tree. And then uh, below that, uh, a more uh, a conifer forest where we can see some pretty significant damage with trees that were bent over uh, from a lot of that ice accumulating uh, and uh, just the weight of the, the ice. Uh, on the on the tree, and then you introduce wind uh, to that, and you can see a, a lot of um, uh, trees that have, have blown over or fallen over uh, as a result. So we're going to go through a few things to consider in your woodland following an ice storm. And number one is always uh, safety. That is your first concern. Uh, and then we'll talk about what trees to cut and what trees uh, to think about leaving uh, and uh, promoting into the future. Uh, we'll briefly touch on uh, this uh, IRS deductions from storm damage. And we'll also just briefly touch on uh, wildfire risk because that is something that we're, we're seeing right now uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, and lastly, uh, just uh, throw up a, a few resources for you uh, to, uh, to find some information that you might need uh, when managing for your woodland. And so safety first. Uh, this is always what we promote uh, as the number one priority following an ice storm because there are so many hazards uh, in, uh, in the woods following an ice storm. Right? We've got uh, these, uh, what we call widow makers. There's these branches or uh, other trees that are hanging up in the canopy. And uh, it might just take a little bit of wind or some uh, movement of that tree and it could release that. Uh, and these branches are incredibly heavy and can do uh, incredible damage. Uh, and uh, and uh, ultimately uh, could uh, kill you if you're in uh, in the woodland, and so we have to take extra preca uh, extra precautions. Uh, it's a very dangerous time to go into your woodland following an ice storm, uh, and even a while after the ice storm, months or even years after the ice storm, there still could be these widow makers uh, in uh, in the canopy. So it's always best uh, to always look up uh, and take a few of these safety tips when going in to manage following uh, an ice storm. <clears throat> And so always wear PPE, uh, personal, personal uh, protective equipment, a hard hat, a protective eyewear. Uh, if you're going to be doing any sort of uh, work with a chainsaw, wearing the, the appropriate equipment, uh, so wearing uh, chaps, 
uh, while you uh, um, are, are sawing inappropriate footwear. Uh, stay out of the woods when the wind is blowing. This is a particularly uh, dangerous time. Again, with those widow makers hanging up in the forest uh, that could release down and um, uh, and uh, strike you if, you if you're underneath and the wind is blowing. Uh, flag and identify dangerous trees uh, while taking extra precautions around those dangerous trees. Uh, get dangerous trees away from roads uh, uh, and trails uh, in your woodland. Um, do not cut or bend, uh, cut bent or pin trees. These are called spring poles. So these are trees that are uh, bent over uh, and they're being held by another uh, object or another tree just waiting to be released. And there's a lot of tension in that uh, in that tree. So when you cut it, it uh, releases that tension. It can snap back up and be uh, incredibly dangerous. So be very careful when you're looking at uh, or when you're seeing these bent uh, and pinned uh, trees. Uh, and always watch overhead. Again, this is uh, something uh, that I have to uh, reiterate over and over again. Watch out for these hanging snags or these widow makers uh, in, uh, in the canopy. Uh, and do not fell lodge trees with a chainsaw. Again, this is similar to the bent trees. Uh, there's a lot of tension in that uh, tree that's lodged and that could release on the chainsaw. It could kick your chainsaw uh, back into you. So be particularly uh, careful uh, working out in the woodlands with any sort of uh, chainsaw or other heavy uh, machinery. And we have resources for you. Uh, to help guide you uh, um, and uh, help um, promote safety in the woodlands. Uh, and this is found uh, on our website, uh, which I will uh, highlight uh, at the end of this, this talk, but we have so many great resources and this is one of them, uh, Safety in the Woods. Uh, and this highlights all of those dangers that we just mentioned. And so what should I think about, or what trees should I think about removing following an ice storm, right? Uh, sometimes it's not necessary to remove any trees if we just had kind of a light disturbance. Other times we might have a much more catastrophic disturbance and we need to remove a, a lot of the, the trees because they're so uh, severely damaged. And so uh, we can talk about exactly what trees uh, might uh, need to be salvaged and what trees uh, could be kept. And that really depends uh, on your woodland, on the species. And so these are unique uh, situations, and it's not easy to relay this information and tell you exactly what to do, uh, but a forester uh, can <clears throat> certainly come out to your woodland, help you assess the damage, the, the hazards in your woodland, uh, and help guide you along this process. Uh, but we're going to go through a couple things that will kind of help give you an idea of what to expect, uh, perhaps what to uh, talk about with, uh, with the forester. And so we've got these uh, different severity uh, of, of damage in the ice storm, uh, and we can uh, salvage the timber depending on the severity of those uh, uh, of the ice storm and how that the severity on uh, our trees. And so there's uh, six main or common things that we see uh, in the woodland. Uh, we see main stem uh, breakage, uh, major branch breakage, uh, bent trees, downed trees, uh, greater than 50% cr uh, crown loss, and less than 50% crown loss. And these are all uh, have different implications for management depending on uh, which type of damage uh, you have in your woodland. So a main stem uh, breakage here you can see is kind of snapped uh, on this tree about a third of the way up. Uh, here's a visual uh, or a, uh, image to reflect this damage. Uh, this tree uh, is obviously um, not going to grow back um, or not going to recover from this, this level of damage. And so depending on if there's merchantable log in uh, where the breakage is, uh, this could be a tree that you would uh, identify as one uh, that might potentially be uh, salvaged in your uh, woodland. Uh, another common damage uh, that we see is a major branch breakage. Uh, you can see in this image uh, that a branch is broken off uh, and in this, this photo uh, representing that. Uh, so 
depending on the species, this tree might uh, recover. But one problem that we have is we opened up that tree uh, to, uh, to the potential for uh, introducing rot into the tree. And so eventually, this tree is likely going to rot uh, uh, starting at where that, that branch had broken off. Uh, and we're going to lose value uh, over time. And it's uh, really not going to recuperate uh, or uh, regain the value that it might have uh, at this particular point. Uh, and so this uh, is uh, considered a non-acceptable growing stock. And if you're going to salvage for timber, you should think about removing uh, this tree as well. Uh, bent trees, uh, so it really depends on how far bent over the tree is and what tree species we're talking about. Uh, we we didn't have this general rule of about 60 degrees for a bent tree. And so uh, you can see this tree here uh, is about 90 degree deflection from uh, going up vertical to going uh, horizontal. And so this tree is likely not going to recover uh, and it's gonna lose uh, value uh, over time. If we have just a slight bend uh, in uh, the tree, uh, depending on the species, uh, it'll likely be able to uh, recover uh, over time. Uh, and then we have down trees, right? And so obviously here, uh, there's, there's uh, no um, growing stock uh, potential in this particular tree. And so this tree is obviously going to be removed. Uh, the timing is, is important for this because we have a tree that's on the ground uh, and it's going to start to decompose. And so the sooner we can extract that tree, uh, the more value that a tree is going to have um, uh, as a timber resource. And you can see here this example of a, of a down tree. This tree uh, in this photo is off the ground, so it's not going to uh, probably rot quite as quickly, uh, but nevertheless it will. Uh, and this, this tree uh, presents a particular hazard as well. Uh, and this is not a tree that you would want to go in uh, and try and uh, buck up yourself. Then we have trees with severe crown loss. Uh, you can see here in this photo, uh, significant damage of the tree. So depending on the species, anywhere from 30 to 50% of uh, crown loss could have uh, detrimental effects on the ability of the tree to regenerate and continue to uh, grow uh, at um, or accumulate um, um, growth uh, over time. Uh, and then we have a low to moderate crown loss, right? And you can see that represented in this, uh, in this uh, photo. And in this photo, uh, or in this particular tree, it's likely going to recover uh, over time. Uh, we still have a majority of the branches that look to be healthy. And so this is a particular tree after storm damage uh, that we would want to uh, probably maintain uh, on, uh, on the landscape and in your uh, woodland. And so it really depends on the severity uh, of the ice storm and the damage that uh, your particular trees have, um, have seen uh, following the ice storm. Uh, and, and again, I can't uh, urge this enough. Safety is always number one. And I always talk to a forester if you have questions. Uh, they're there to help. They can help assess uh, the severity of the damage and help you make uh, appropriate management decisions. So what can I do if I've lost <clears throat> a, lot, a significant amount of revenue from uh, my woodland? And so there are tax deductions uh, that you can uh, make if you've had severe uh, timber damage uh, from, uh, from a storm. Uh, fire, ice, uh, tornado, uh, et cetera. And this really depends on how your property is uh, defined and whether or not uh, a federal uh, emergency was declared. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of uh, details that go along with whether or not you can claim a tax reduction. And so if, if it's uh, a personal um, uh, property uh, that is used for your personal enjoyment, uh, that uh, the only way you can claim a tax uh, deduction is if, um, if uh, it was declared a federal 
uh, emergency. And right now, uh, Kentucky has requested that um, the government uh, declare a federal emergency for not just this ice storm, but uh, for the flooding that we uh, have just seen. So uh, we'll have to wait and see whether uh, this is declared a federal emergency and whether your uh, personal, whether your landowner uh, for the personal enjoyment of your property, including timber resources, and how you can uh, file uh, tax deductions. And so uh, keep an eye uh, on that and, and reach out if you have any questions on, on tax deductions. And then uh, lastly, uh, wildfire risks. And so when uh, we have this ice storm, there's a lot more uh, trees that are bent over, a lot more branches on the ground, a lot more fuel for the wildfire. And then we have a drying event like we've had. Uh, there's actually an increased risk of wildfire uh, right now. You introduce chainsaws uh, into the forest that can create uh, a spark for wildfire. And so it's uh, just so important uh, to be extra careful, uh, particularly right now when you're in your woodland following an ice storm uh, and you're trying to manage for that damage, um, but understanding that there is a risk uh, of wildfire uh, right now. So be extra careful right now. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a, a website, kytimberdamage.ca.uky.edu. Uh, we've got plenty of resources uh, on this website for you. Um, ranging from all the topics that we covered here uh, today. So uh, please reach out uh, and contact us uh, if you have any questions uh, or any uh, concerns about uh, your woodland following uh, ice damage. Well, thank you, Jacob. We greatly appreciate you uh, going over that because I know that's a lot of helpful and useful information for everyone out there that's had any kind of ice damage from the, from the past storms that we've had. Yeah, it is a lot of information, uh, and um, and it's there's a lot of resources out there to help. Uh, I'll uh, just preface this by saying I'm not a tax expert, <laughs> uh, and um, so don't grill me too hard on all the <laughs> intricacies of whether you're eligible for a tax uh, deduction or not, but. Someone did ask, is timber damage eligible for disaster relief? Yeah, and I, I think it, a lot of this comes down to two factors, whether your land is uh, an industrial forest or whether it's uh, a personal, uh, I can't remember the exact term, a personal enjoyment land of a federal emergency was, um, or a federal emergency was declared. And so those are kind of the two factors that play into whether you're eligible or not for a, uh, a tax deduction. But as you mentioned before, please be safe out there, folks. There's some pretty dangerous conditions or could be, so yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, I don't have a woodlands, but in my backyard alone, I have a, I guess you're calling it a wood, widow maker because I have a limb that's in a crook of another limb and it's just right now Fighting. it's wind blowing really hard and I'm like, come on, throw it out because I can't reach it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. It's not just our woodlands, but mm -hmm. uh, the trees around our house that uh, you should look up and pay attention to. So exactly. yeah, that's a great point, Renee. So it's not just your woodlands that you might yeah. need to yeah. pay attention. Even if you're just out in a park somewhere, I mean, it could, right. could easily have happened, you know. So we did have another question or a comment about um, you can flag dangerous trees with killer tree tape, which is a uh, skull and uh, crossbones on the tape. <laughs> you, you certainly can do that. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So. Well, check out that resource, folks. It's, it's really there's a lot of good information. I know you did cover a lot of ground there, Jacob, but I really appreciate you and the team putting that together. That's a, a great resource. It really is. And we will definitely put that um, on the uh, website, the, the thing you did, uh, just the video. So maybe people can, can see more of it and we can put it on the um, Timber Damage website. That way um, people can actually go through and see everything and stop and pause and write down things. I know that's how <laughs> I am anyway. <laughs> That's a great thing about the recordings for sure. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And as a reminder, all of our shows are available via recordings on, on fromthewoodstoday.com. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Jacob. We greatly yes. appreciate you being on. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. Uh, Renee, we've done it again.
Always, right? <laughs> oh, no, another loaded show. Really, a lot of good content. You know, um, you know, if you haven't seen that whole Forestry 101 series, we have that on our website as well. So you can check out all of those if you missed those for sure. Um, you know, and and then the website there, the Kentucky Timber Damage. Um, check that out as well. And then, as always, the trees of the week are being populated on our um, Common Trees of Kentucky page. So that's exciting and a lot of great resources for you all out there. You know, um, next week, too, we are having an interest, a couple of interesting segments, um, one on the cicadas that are going to be emerging. And I've been hearing uh, a lot about them. I know, right? You know, so that's going to be something that's going to be big. And so um, we are going to have Jonathan Larson on to talk about that. And also uh, Bobby, Bobby Ammerman with our shop is going to be talking about the Wood Utilization Center. So um, if you've ever been interested in, you know, e either one of those topics and, you know, Lori will be back on with another Tree of the Week. Um, so we encourage you to join in next week at 11 o'clock. No doubt. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being with us every week and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.